beginning or the Q&A? We are, yes. Okay. So I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you didn't log off. Um. I, you know, it's funny, I, I did leave, but it wouldn't just, I, I didn't, didn't let me leave because there I was again on the live stream. Okay, and we are live. Um, thank you everyone for your patience. I am so sorry. My name is Beth Gilligan we from, are. from yes. the Coolidge Corner. So, but yeah, I'm glad you um, and um, we are, sorry, I realized I was, the live stream was going there. Um, we were on the wrong live stream, but now we're on the correct one. And we are so glad that everyone um, is here and waiting patiently to join us today. Um, this has been a very long 10 months for the theater. Our, our doors have been closed and the virtual screening room has been a great way of connecting with our audiences. Um, this film, The Reason I Jump, opened in our virtual screening room on Friday, January 8th. Um, if you haven't already seen it, um, it will be playing there for a while. I'd encourage you to spread the word. Um, your, your ticket purchase supports our nonprofit organization, but more importantly, you are experiencing this wonderful documentary film. And we feel very honored to have the filmmaker with us today, Jerry Rothwell, um, to have of Emma and Donna Budway and Ben and Bertram McGann who are featured in the film with us and to have Caitlin Flint from NBC 10 Boston here to moderate. Um, I'm gonna turn things over briefly to Rebecca Lubins from Understanding Our Differences. They are a local nonprofit um, who has partnered with us on this film. They do incredible work in our community and um, we're thrilled to, to have um, members of the Understanding Our Differences community tuned into the live stream. So take it away, Rebecca, and then we'll get to the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Beth. We are incredibly pleased to partner on presenting this film and we just thank Caitlin Flint so much for moderating the upcoming panel. As Beth said, Understanding Our Differences is a Newton, Massachusetts-based nonprofit we provide disability awareness education to elementary school students. Our curriculum covers 10 disabilities and chronic medical conditions and includes a unit on autism. Our goal is to foster respectful and inclusive schools and communities for people of all abilities and really to combat the negative attitudes that limit people with disabilities every day. As several parents say in the film, we want our child to be looked at with love and empathy and for there to be a world of understanding for our child. That's exactly what understanding our differences strives to achieve. That outcome is our shared dream with you. I hope you enjoy the panel. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And I will let, turn things over to Caitlin for the discussion. Thank you again, everyone. Well, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone who's joining us from home or wherever you may be remotely tuning in and to all the panelists for making time today to join us to just have a, a nice conversation about the film and your participation in it. Thank you so much for letting us into your lives, Ben and Emma and, and both Bertra and Donna as well. And Jerry, thank you for putting this film together. It's so easy to see why it's already getting such recognition worldwide. And it really does tie into understanding our differences messages here at home in Massachusetts and beyond. So it's just was a beautiful film. And I wanted to start with a question that we had posed to Ben and Emma uh, just before we started so we could get their answers. And I think the first thing that jumped out at me, you play such a big role in, in this movie and letting us see into your worlds. How does it feel to have your story shared in this film? And we can start with Emma. Emma answered, it is a gorgeous film and I'm very proud to be part of this project. I do think the film shows the richness of our lives. It truly does. Right. And Ben, what was, what was your answer? Ben's response was, it feels good. It feels great to be part of the film. I feel a bit exposed, but it is important for the story to be told. It truly is. I think everyone on this webinar and this panel and in the audience agrees with that. And I can understand that feeling. And I think, I don't know if Jerry, you want to speak to that. I mean, by really giving us that, that true glimpse into this world, uh, that, that seems to be the goal here to have this raw understanding of what this world encompasses. Tell me, why did you want to make this book into a film? Was it the writing, the subject matter? What really caught your eye and, and made you decide you wanted to do this project? I think um, when I first came across the book, which was um, 
uh, shown to me by the two of the producers, uh, Jeremy and Stevie, who's, who are the parents of Joss, um, the young autistic boy from England that you see in the film. Um, I think there were two things that really struck me about it. First was that it, it took you into this very sensory, very sensorily different world, you know, way of seeing things that was very different from from my own, but then ways in which they had re had resonances for you, things you could kind of understand and and sort of recognize. Uh, and and the second was that the book was so kind of perceptive about other people, you know, that Naoki clearly spent a lot of his time trying to understand how the neurotypical world worked. Um, and that really changed for me that idea that people have, that autistic people have no theory of mind, you know, it kind of really shifted that, that stereotype. Um, so I went to Japan, I met with Naoki, um, I watched him use the writing technique he uses, which is this, you know, kind of quite laborious pointing to a, a, a cardboard letterboard and uh, does it completely kind of unsupported. He doesn't use the, those sort of more controversial techniques that people have used in the past. He types at a computer keyboard as well. Um, and I sort of suggested the idea of the film to him. He was very happy with that idea, but not at all interested in being in it. You know, my first idea about the film was that this would be a film about Nike, about this 12 year old who'd found his voice, you know, and, be, and, and become a writer. Um, but I think a bit like like Ben just said, you know, the kind of exposure of the book and he had been part of a couple of Japanese uh, documentaries. I think he'd kind of had enough and just wanted his words to stand for themselves. So that sent a film in a different direction, maybe a more interesting one, um, where Naoki's words were a kind of tool to let us be, live alongside for a, a little while uh, with the different people that are in the film. So... I had, guess we'll go back to Ben and Emma just for a moment because we have an answer for them um, as far as what their hopes are for what this film should achieve. What do you want this film to achieve, Emma? All right, hold on. I've got the next answer. Let me ask her that now. And you want to go ahead and take that while we get ready? Right, Ben has addressed this question with other Q&As and his response was that he wants people to, to know that autistic people are, are different, but not broken. Mm -hmm. Autism is not something that needs to be fixed. Which all right, we, we have an answer that Emma prepared for an earlier q and as well. And it is, I think the film is amazing and incredible look into our lives. It is not easy being autistic, but our lives can include beauty, friendship, love, and a richness you cannot imagine. My hope for the film is that we can show the world a better way forward to include all autistics in school, employment, housing, and society. Wonderful answer. You know, before we go back to Jerry, I'll pose a question to both of you if you wanted to start answering it and we can go back to Jerry for a moment. But Jerry just brought up the whole idea of trying to show this, this world, this very sensory world and doing it through film. I guess my question to both of you, Ben and Emma, is do you think watching this film, it does give others a glimpse into how you see the world? Do you want me to speak to that whilst? Uh, sure, well, I can actually, as far as a film, I think there's probably, as I can only imagine, there were, I'd love to hear about the challenges that kind of you had to overcome to take a, a book and then translate this into a film. And you really use so many different techniques to bring us into this world as far as sound and light. So talk a little bit about how you, you did this in a film way to really bring mm -hmm. us into this world. So the book, I mean, in some ways, the book is an unpromising start for a film, you know, it's 58 questions and 58 answers, questions that Naoki thinks, you know, typical people want to know about autism and Naoki's answers about his own experience. But those answers are kind of the very poetic, they, they give a lot of hints maybe about how, particularly about that, the sort of sensory uh, experience he has. And one of them, for example, was, you know, Naoki describes 
seeing detail before he can put the detail into the big picture and getting immersed in the detail of things. Um, so that felt like visually, that was a kind of maybe an interesting technique to use visually in the film. Um, when we came across the artist, Amrit Karana, who's an autistic artist, non-speaking non autistic artist in Delhi in India, she does these, you know, she started at the age of <clears throat> four or five using drawing as a way of communicating with her mother. And that now, now she's 23. And, that's turned into these incredible artworks, which sort of are very precise about their sort of details of people, the things she's seen on the street. Um, so that felt a great way into taking an audience into a different kind of sensory world. And then the other, I guess the other sort of big technique we used in the film was, we decided we wanted to, to make the film with in 360 degree sound. Um, and we did that because we felt we wanted to, I, I, well, partly because we thought the film was going to be in cinemas, which at the moment <laughs> it's, it's only on laptops, but there's a kind of equivalent going on. But we wanted to um, be able to position sounds in a way that maybe wasn't the, the kind of neurotypical way of focusing on particular sounds. So to, so to try and take a viewer into maybe something that was a little bit disorientating. Uh, and I worked with sound artist, um, Nick Ryan, who himself is synesthetic and synesthesia is quite common in, in non-speaking autistic people. So I think he had a kind of non-neurotypical take on, on sound. He's done a lot of work around that. Um, and we sort of, we based this really recording sounds in people's environments and then, and then just thinking about how could we position those sounds in ways that might make us think about those places and the experience of being them within them in a different way. I'm not sure if they're still working on their questions and their answers. And if so, I can ask you a follow up to that as far as do you have a favorite scene that you think really accomplished what you were trying to portray, what you were using, you know, as far as your use of all these techniques? Is there one scene to you that sticks out? That's quite, I mean, that's an interesting question. There's a, there's a scene which tries, uh, Naki writes about his experience of hearing rain and how he needs to go through all of his memories of rain or lots of his memories of rain and the sound of rain in order to establish that it's raining. Um, it's actually in a, in a different piece of writing he does this. But, um, and so for that, that scene, we happened to have filmed Amrit uh, in a thunderstorm sort of on her balcony. Uh, and Nick then kind of took those sounds and started to add to them the sounds of things that weren't rain but sounded like rain and to position those around. So it's almost like triggering the memory of a piece of paper crinkling or um, things that might be rain but weren't quite or you know so, so that that was a sort of way of really trying to trying to link um, sound with memory I suppose um, and trying to imagine what that's like that that, that that being a kind of necessary I suppose a lot of us um, a lot of us link uh, I, I would say well a lot of us link music with memory don't we you know a particular piece of music can take us to a particular moment in time and I just think that many autistic people that's like turned up to a hundred and a you know, much more intense experience. Donna it looks like I can't tell if you, you look like you you have Emma's answer ready for us. We do we do. Oh. So Emma answered I do the intensity is there it can be so chaotic and certainly the film captures the beauty as well. I can see that definitely. And I did pose the same question to Ben. So do you think it does give us all a glimpse into your world? He says, yes, the film captures the influence of sensory inputs on our behaviors and, and impulses and motivations. That we are not just wandering aimlessly. We very much respond to sensory input. And I think that that was leading me to a question I wanted to ask, and we have a few viewer questions too I want to bring in as well. But I think I'll, I'll post this to both to you, Bertra and Donna, um, for you know for the moms here. The book and the film really talk about changing the way people think about autism. That idea, as Ben mentioned, that there aren't emotions involved, there's no imagination involved, and you know you see how hard. Uh, that the book and, and Barry's work tries to take people away from that notion. So do you think that this really did what it needed to do to counter the assumption um, that people have when it comes to that? Bertrand, I don't know. Bertrand, you, if you want to start. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. You know, I, I think the film successfully challenges preconceived notions. Mm -hmm of the non-speaking autistic community, which 
as you know, has not really been presented. Uh, we, we've seen the savants of the autistic community, um, but we've not seen nor heard from this portion of the autism community. And to that extent, I think it's very uh, revealing in, in an important and timely way. No, I agree. And I think another really unique thing about this is that it does show families under whatever circumstance are surviving and love their children and are making community. And I think the way it shows Ben and Emma's friendship is a gift, quite frankly. I mean, it's, it, it is there, even though they can't have a regular conversation or, um, you know, maybe it doesn't look like a typical friendship, but it's, it's been sustained, as Bertra says. I mean, can you imagine the work it has taken to sustain a friendship over a lifetime when you can't even just casually, you know, greet each other and and welcome each other? So um, I do think that is that Jerry and his crew did a beautiful job with that, and I think it's a great um, shows great respect for um, Ben and Emma and and their other um, autistics, non speaking autistics in the film. And I think Ben, was it, did you call Emma? You said she was badass, right? I think in one scene and that was, you know, like you had, you, you, you're like, she's, you have a real friendship there and you, just like you would say about any best friend that you have. <laughs> and Donna, while Ben's writing to that, I, we are getting some of the questions coming in. Uh, obviously we're watching and we saw through the film Ben and Emma using their letter boards. I think there are a lot of questions when it comes to that and their access to that. My first question was just to get into this topic was just to ask you how much life has changed for Emma and for yourself, just the dynamic when she started using the letter board. I mean, it's clearly changed everything. I mean, Emma is now part of all the decisions that are made about her life. I mean, we, as you saw in the film, they were getting ready when the film was being made to move into their apartment. They've now been in their apartments for a year. They're neighbors, which is exciting. We can knock on the wall if Ben's being too loud. It's always the other way. Ben is never too loud. But um, we wouldn't have been able to make that decision, really, if we, I mean, Emma was able to weigh in on that decision and tell us that that was what she wanted to do. I mean, she can make decisions about employment, um, about who is going to be her roommate. She has a roommate change coming up this weekend, like we couldn't have done any of this without knowing, I mean, we couldn't have done it the way we should have done it with respect and working collaboratively together. So, I mean, that the outcome of her life is, I mean, it's from, the, from when she was diagnosed and her pediatrician told us she would be institutionalized to moving into her own apartment and having her friends on the hall. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than we could ever ask for. And Ben, you, you wanted to weigh in when I when I brought up that scene. <laughs> ben says, Emma is my best friend and I admire her a lot. That's wonderful. Let me ask you both. People are asking, can Ben and Emma use a keyboard rather than a letter board? People are curious as to the difference between the two. If Bertra, if you want to start. Sure, it's it's the the gross motor using gross motor to, to communicate uh, is, is, an, is an evolving process for us. Uh, the letter board is held horizontally in front of him and you know the keyboard is held, yeah. is flat on a flat surface and that affects the visual trajectory. And so while he can use a keyboard, he is most communicative using a letter board. He can write but he is most fluent using the letter board. You know, I can ask him to write something on the whiteboard and he waits for prompts and he's not sure. And yet if I put the letter board in front of him, he spells with, with confidence. So that is his preferred method at this time. Is it the same Donna for, for Emma or is it is it a different situation? Emma, um... I actually can type independently and um, well, she can, if she wants to navigate something on a web page, believe me, she can do a lot of really <laughs> fast typing. Her communication is different. She can use a wireless keyboard that is held on a stand um, 
either I'm holding the stand or it is a single stand, but she is um, very exhausted as many of our friends in the community are of people um, inferring that this is some type of hocus pocus and it is her new year's resolution that, um, so she can tell them in her own words <laughs> directly what she thinks of their um, opinion of her is that she really is trying to become as independent a typist as she is. But you know, you look at our friend, our friend Naoki, he is also typing completely independently and he still has to answer a barrage of questions about the possibility that he could be who he is. I would mean, I, they just keep moving the goalposts, so. <laughs> right, and that I, I can imagine the frustrations that that must lead to on so many levels for not just Ben and Emma, but for both of you, Bertrand and Donna, as moms who are living this daily and communicating daily with your children. Um, we'll, I have a question for both of you. This is coming from a viewer, and I can leave this for, for Ben and Emma for a moment and go back to Jerry for a second, but someone, Alex, is asking, what improvements to education do Ben and Emma want to see to help non-speaking autistic individuals in schools? So improvements to education is what people are curious if you have ideas there. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted to ask Jerry another question. There are so many powerful moments in this film. I mean, it's hard to actually count them all. There seemed like there was just one after the other. It was such an emotional journey, but there was one that, that stood out for it just being such a heavy moment in the film. There is such a lightness to the film, but there is a moment where Jess's mom is leading that group discussion with other mothers and is talking about with them and listening to them to their experiences and what they've been hearing from people in their public, in their daily lives, just about bringing their children out into the world. I, I guess, why did you feel it was so important to include that, that scene? Because it did seem a little different than some of the other scenes in the film, it definitely had a heavy note to it. Why did you want that in there? Um, I think I think because stigma is, I mean, the short answer is because stigma is such a large part of autistic people's lives. And it feel, felt to me that at that point in the film, you're going, you know, that you've begun the film in, in a lot in people's interior worlds and just a sensory experience, but by the and, and, and you go through Ben and Emma and you're in a kind of advocacy phase of the film. And it felt feels that when you come to Justina, that section of the film is about societies and what societies need to do to become more inclusive. And I, I'd been shooting in Sierra Leone for another film, and I because I, I was really interested in exploring how autism played out there. Um, and Mary's mum was doing this incredible work uh, with um, families in communities, in mostly in rural communities, where there were kind of very particular traditional ideas about autism and gen disability generally, that it, that it um, was a product of, of, um, of the devil, you know, and that, that people had something devilish in them. And, and as a consequence, children are abandoned and even killed. And uh, you know, and I think that that's something that's also, you know, it's not so long since those responses have been a part of our societies um, and still are in some in some countries. Um, you know, the, the, the institutionalization, you look at Germany in the 30s, autistic people were, were, were part of the genocide that happened there. Um, and, and I think that stigma is never far away in a way that sort of, you know, we're that, that kind of failure of the neurotypical, the belief it by the by neurotypical people that uh, autism is less than human is a really um, strong and entrenched belief. And it felt important to put that in the film. And before we get Ben and Emma's answers to the question regarding education, just tying into that scene, I know you were helping with some answers, but Donna and Bertra, I was asking about the scene where Jess's mom was talking and listening to other mothers sharing these really heavy interactions they've had in their communities just with bringing their own children out in public. It was it was hard to watch. It was very raw. It was, seemed very honest. It was very heavy. I just, how hard is that for you to watch? And then I guess, I think everybody's personal experiences probably are so different and vast. But my second part to that is, do you think that the narrative is changing? Because just as mom said it afterwards, that the narrative is changing. Do you agree with that? So twofold, what was your reaction to that scene? Do you think the narrative's changing? Uh, Don, I'll go first. I think, you know, Ben said, you know, the film allows us to see autism around the world. There, while the journey is very unique for each family, uh, there, there are some common threads. And, and for my family, this sense of isolation 
was just overwhelming. You know, uh, family didn't understand, friends didn't understand. Um, we were very uh, just defensive of, of Ben's behavior, um, which again is why the friendship with the Budways was just so valuable. Uh, both families had three siblings. Uh, both Ben and Emma were the youngest of the siblings. And as Ben says, we, his memory of his childhood is spending a lot of time with, with the Budways. So uh, the stigma, yes, the, the isolation, uh, the, uh, you know, the disrespect, the disrespect from especially uh, academics and educators who feel that they know what your child will never do. So um, yes, certainly in a more raw form mm -hmm. uh, in the un, uh, less developed world, but that's certainly a common thread. Right. Yeah, I don't think it's easy for any family um, anywhere in the world, but right, we, we didn't feel like Emma's life was at risk, but certainly the stairs, people telling you what you needed to do with your child, wanting you to get your child out of whatever space you were in, it's intense. And you, it, it's absolutely, I think before you find even a good pediatrician or whatever, you need to find a community, you need to find a friend. I mean, it, it really is the, the friendships in our lives and with the McGann's was completely sustaining because it's not just the child with a disability, right? It's siblings that also can't have guests to the house or feel like, um, their life has kind of gotten off path. So it, it's, it's been so important to us. And the question is the narrative changing. I think um, films like this help to make that happen, to see the potential, to see the joy, to see the progress. Um, you know, we're, you know, miles outside the nation's capital and we weren't able to get our children access to what they needed in school. Um, they weren't included. They, they wouldn't teach them past the grade level that they assigned to their outward abilities. So um, it's <laughs> it's not that we've gotten so far ahead of everybody else, but certainly there's a lot of people working very hard on the partners here on, on this call today. On, and we really appreciate the work you're doing for advocacy, but there is a lot to do, but definitely where it's getting better. I mean, I watched that scene I don't know that I could have answered those questions about Argentina as quickly as both of them or put my answers in such a, a well said form. So um, a lot of questions about the education. So we did pose one to both of them um, originally from Alex, just asking what they want to see to help non-speaking autistic individuals in schools. So I don't know if Ben has his answer for that. He does. Ben says, I want to see communication choice in the schools including spelling to communicate. And I, I would just add to his response that uh, the, the choice is important, you know? Um, uh, it was a long experience with speech and language therapy before we realized that speech was not going to be Ben's primary mode of communication. Uh, along the way, we requested sign language instruction, ASL. And the schools deny ASL for Ben because he's not deaf, which in my mind is absurd. And I think when you hear Ben's and Emma's voices now and how critical the capacity to communicate is, uh, I think it certainly should be prioritized uh, in the schools so that all children have access to general education. I'll ask Ben a question too while I go to Donna's answer, but someone did ask, uh, how did Ben learn to spell and read? And I will move to Donna. I know you have Emma's answer to the education questions. So what was she, what are her thoughts? Emma would like access to curriculum grade, age appropriate curriculum, full inclusion, access to the letter board and communication support. And this is a question I can leave for Emma while we start working on this one, but Emma, someone asked, what can we as parents do better 
to support our son learning to communicate. He loves all of the different kinds of keyboards on his iPad, AAC, but needs facilitation. So what can parents be doing to help their children better communicate? We can leave that for you. Jerry, while they're answering those questions, I did want to ask you this. Um, we obviously you mentioned your, your initial thought would be this film would take a very different direction that maybe it was going to be about now, Key. Clearly that, that wasn't the end goal or the end result eventually once you got a little further along. But the film is so deeply rooted in his words. It's his narration that kind of takes us along this journey. So can you explain a little bit? We do have these scenes with this young boy. He starts the film off, kind of closes the film out, and he's just sort of roaming through these different landscapes. Can you talk about what that, what that kind of meant to you to include that streaming throughout the film? Yeah, so um, the book includes, so, so, so I suppose a couple of things. First of all, I, I was very wary of a, a, a film where you ended up with readings from the book, making it feel like that the other, the, the people in the film, like Ben and Emma, were kind of case studies for the book. You know, you'd hear a bit of book and then you'd go to Ben and Emma and, and, and that would be resonant of what you heard in the book. And and so I wanted a kind of space in which you could put the book that wasn't always with, with um, the documentary characters, if you like. And the, the Naki's book closes off with this short story about a boy called Shun uh, and Shun is involved in a, an accident and, and dies but is unaware that he's dead <laughs> um, and in the process of that he kind of floats around the world and kind of goes and sees things and visits visits people and none of them acknowledge him I think it's kind of in a way a metaphor for being sort of invisible um, but that kind of led me to think about, you know, that, that sort of Nauki at the age that he wrote the book and whether we could somehow represent him visually. And I, I came across, you know, we tried to cast with different autistic actors and there was a young, uh, um, actually not an actor at the time, a young non-speaking autistic boy, Jim Fujiwara in the UK, he's a Japanese British boy. And he seemed kind of ideal really to be the person that could maybe carry that, that sort of spirit of the book. Um, David Mitchell calls the book, I, I think he says the book is like a kind of envoy from his son's world and I sort of think of that character of the boy almost being as an embodiment of the book or and, and we see Jim in, in a you know kind of on a journey and it's a journey sort of home I guess and it's a journey uh, through these landscapes in which he becomes absorbed um, and it felt you could just give the, give the film a sort of different thoughtful tone in those moments I guess. So interesting. And it, it, I mean, it came out so beautifully. I mean, you can feel that the story coming through and it doesn't seem like you're actually weaving in between other stories. It seems like one cohesive story because I think the subject matter just resonates continuously. Uh, I do wanna go back because we did ask Ben a question from one of our viewers. So how did Ben learn how to read and spell? <laughs> so Ben says, I learned to read and spell using flashcards uh, at home, after school, and during summers. I was taught by teachers and therapists and we used ABA. And mom, what was your thought process, you know, for others who are maybe starting this journey, advice you may have to them if they are, you know, trying to get their children to start learning and to spell and read? You know, um, all parents of autism demonstrate initiative. And when, when the schools, announced to me that Ben would never read, he would never spell, he would never count, he'd never know his numbers. They just had this list of things Ben would never do that they declared at age eight, mind you. Um, I decided, no, he, he can learn. And so we hired therapists, we hired teachers during the summer to come and, and teach Ben the curriculum that was not offered him in the schools. And I still have in my mud room a, a crate of some of the materials and tools that were used. And that's why I asked Ben, you remember yeah. some of the tools? He said flashcards, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's as you would teach any child to read. You teach the alphabet, you teach the sounds and the basic, the basic words and you build vocabulary. And, you know, uh, Ben does have some speech. It's terribly unreliable. Uh, so when he's reading The Cat in the Hat, I could certainly enjoy 
his reading of the cat in the hat. You know, it would not pass muster as reading in the schools, but we decided not to rely upon the predictions of the schools and, and to proceed with our expectation that he would be able to, to uh, matriculate uh, to, to his capacity. And, and that's, what we, that's what we saw. To go back to Emma, you were answering a question from someone watching us right now. And they said their son right now is in the midst of trying to learn how to communicate. So they were asking for some advice if you had some on how you think that they could help facilitate that with him. Emma's advice was read everything to your son to keep the input rich, get training on the letter board and practice every day. It's, it's arduous. It's a long haul. That's what mom will say. It's like <laughs> practice. I mean, my husband had his New Year's resolution one year and it took him pretty much till November until he was fluent on the letter board. So it's a lot of hours, but um, just stick with it. Mm -hmm. Find a community where you live, um, where there are spellers and um, get some training and get working, get to work. Mom, Donna, do you think that it's gotten better over the last few years as far as access to education, to programs, to, I mean, just hearing Bertra's talking about how basically schools were sh almost shutting the, the, down the idea of furthering an education, which seems so counterintuitive on so many levels, you know, did, has it changed at all or is, are there still those major roadblocks and hurdles right now? I think there's definitely roadblocks. I mean, I definitely see equity issues surrounding this. I mean, families that have the resources to hire summer staff like the McGann's did, or, you know, I left the workforce to kind of manage all of this. I mean, this is just, just not sustainable. It's not realistic. So you think about all the children who just got the school system to tell them their child wasn't going to be able to read or write or count past the fourth grade. I mean, it's, it's terrible for any family, but to make it, you know, there it's, I think it's, there's it's definitely like everything else, right? There's more possibility for people that have resources and, and community and connection, but so it, it does alarm us. And I think that's been an MF told us that's one of the reasons they are so committed to this advocacy mm -hmm. and to letting themselves be exposed because they recognize that they have had great advantages. Although it's very difficult to live in this world, they, they are now spelling and they're taking university classes and they're learning and they have friends. They've moved into their own apartments, but they recognize that there are so many children, even in our own country, even in the nation's capital, that are not gonna be able to get access to the curriculum they deserve. I will say we are we have surpassed one of our 30 minute markers. So I wanna encourage anyone who is watching, if there's a last question to write in, feel free, this is your chance to just get that out there. I want to just end uh, with two questions, one for Emma, one for Ben. And I, the question I had was Emma, in the film, when you're talking about education, and I think that's such a, an important part of all of this, and that's what a lot of these questions are coming in about the education aspect of this. Emma said before the letter board, when you were asked about that, um, you said they wasted time. How do you feel now? And similarly, Ben, you had an, an answer too. You said they denied our civil rights. And I wanted to ask Ben if he thinks it's gotten any better. And while they're answering that, I think Jerry, you know, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you was throughout the research process of this film and just the development of the film, now that it's, it's out there too, and you're hearing from people who, who are watching this for the first time, do you think you have learned something in this journey? If there is something that you're going to take away from, from this film on a personal level? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I probably see the world in a somewhat different way uh, now than when I started making the film. It makes me much more aware of, well, at the, at the sensory level, it makes me much more aware of the sensory environment and its potential impact on others. Um, you know, really sorry about this wallpaper actually which is a bit of a sensory kind of overload um but I'm not looking at it um but yeah so I think I think that I think it you know I, I also as part of the research for the film read a, a lot of uh this incredible literature that's emerging um from non-speaking autistic writers um and met quite a few of them as well Tito Mukhopadhyay in uh, Austin and uh Ida Kedar 
um, yeah, their, and their writing and, and also um, sort of speaking writers like Donna Williams, I mean, and their writing has a lot of sort of common touch points, you know, they're, they're, they're describing a similar kind of experience. Everyone has their own different iteration of that, but there are a lot of common touch points there. And I think that, you know, I'd kind of urge if, if people to, to sort of go and, and read that, that, because apart from anything else, some of it is absolutely great literature. You know, Tito's work as a writer is really extraordinary and, uh, and well worth uh, the time and energy of reading. Emma, it looks like you might be, you might be ready to, to weigh in there. Emma says, I am busy and definitely not wasting time, but I had to exit the school system to really start my life. Okay. And what about Ben? You had said you felt that they had denied our civil rights. So do you think it's gotten better? I think if Ben is still working on his answer, actually, Donna, I can ask you kind of a sort of a wrap up question and I'll pose to everybody. It's just because obviously we're working right now with understanding our differences. Their goal is to get out there in school systems, promote inclusion, promote awareness and do what they can to make sure everybody is recognized. What do you think we need to do uh, on a school level, on a level as far as society goes to foster inclusion? Is there something that, that parents can be doing with their children that schools can be doing? I mean, what can we be doing to try to make greater strides in this world? I think we just have to commit to doing it. I mean, next year, I mean, September, when the schools open up, why are we segregating people out? I mean, we know it doesn't work. We don't have good outcomes. We can look at generations of children that were put in the basement room or the side classroom and they didn't have access to the curriculum. They don't do as well in the community. The community doesn't know them. They remain this weird group of people that seem threatening and the unknown. I mean, until our neighbors know us, we're not gonna be able to move anything. I mean, until we have full inclusion in every school district in the country, um, I mean, that is the absolute first thing we need to do and we need to do it. I mean, we need to be thoughtful about it. We need to train people, but we have got to do it. And let's go back to Ben Ben's answer there. If he thinks anything's gotten better after he made that, that statement. Um, ben says, I think there is so much more work to be done. We have to make it better for young people with autism. And Bertrand, to the same point, I just asked Donna, but you know, what could you say are some ways that we can be more inclusive of people with nonverbal autism in general? Because that might just be the first step too for families who are watching this. What can people be doing to be more inclusive? You know, I think very important for parents particularly is to presume the competence of their children. It is so easy to settle into um, not necessarily a happy place, but just kind of a comfortable place that your kid doesn't understand. He really doesn't feel the exclusion. He doesn't realize the other kids are playing with him. He doesn't know that he's being segregated. He's just kind of in his own world, which is what we were told for years. We have to dispel that notion. They, they, it's been so humbling to hear Ben's voice and to realize that he's totally aware when he's disrespected. He's totally aware when he's excluded. He even said, I'll just add, when um, asking when did he realize he had autism, he said, well, I overheard mom telling grandmother that Ben has autism and I remember mom saying, don't worry, don't worry. It's just something we have to manage. And he said, I thought I was sick, but I felt fine. And I said, Ben, when did you realize that you were different? And he said, when I wasn't allowed to stay in the classroom with the other kids. That's when I knew autism meant I was different. And he was moved to a segregated classroom in kindergarten. So that's been the value and just the reward of, of finally hearing Ben's voice, finally realizing his, his uh, enabling him to realize uh, a, a capacity to communicate is 
much of what we were told was uh, was wrong. It was just flat wrong. And I think as parents, um, presuming the confidence, as Emma says, keep reading to them. Uh, I remember when Ben was young and I, I would just talk to him, even though it was a one-way conversation. And I'm sure the neighbors thought I was completely bad at walking and talking with this kid whom, whom couldn't talk. But what you realize is that he remembers everything. He, his, his, his knowledge now is just flabbergasting because he was denied a formal education. And it's, it's heartbreaking. But I can tell you that I'm, I'm more emotional about the time lost as, as Emma talked about, um, because these kids are so passionate about advocacy and telling their story. And, and again, that's why the film is so important and it's such a, a, a strong instrument for advocacy because we were all wrong. We were all wrong, you know? And we, you know, the letter board wasn't our first choice. The letter board was at the end of our journey to find a communication uh, method for Ben. And his speech therapist, Elizabeth Basu said, let me try one more thing. And Ben was 17 years old. So I just think that the, the passion of parents to, as Stephen, my husband, and I said, when Ben was diagnosed, we don't know where this journey is gonna take us, but we are going to hit the wall at full speed. And I think you, that inner drive and commitment is, is what pushes us all along and continues to give us hope. Very well said, Bertrand. Thank you for that. I mean, Jerry, your film is, is helping to spark those conversations. And I think everyone's on the same page where everyone hopes that this is only continues that conversation and brings about more change. So what's, Jerry, you know, your film, uh, final thoughts, if you want to wrap this up and just tell us, looking ahead, you know, where do you think it goes from here? Well, I mean, hearing Bertrand and Ben and Emma and Donna speak and, and, and hopefully be listened to is a really exciting, you know, I think if the, if the film can help us hear the voices of, of if it's not a contradiction, the voices of non-speaking autistic people um, more loudly and pay attention to them, then I think uh, I'll be happy for one. Well, thank you all for joining us, Donna and Emma. Thank you so much for being here, Bertra and Ben. Thank you. And Ben and Emma, thank you for letting us into your worlds and showing us, you know, a little bit about yourselves and coming along on this journey. It was so wonderful to get to meet you both. I feel like I know you from watching the film and getting to talk to you today. And Jerry, congratulations on just all of the recognition that this film is so deservingly receiving right now. Um, if anybody is going to be able to share this link, you know, and has further questions, it would be wonderful. We'll try to keep a chain going on social media and people can sort of weigh in, but it's been really wonderful to be a part of this. And, and thank you so much. It looks like Ben has a final thought too. <laughs> ben says, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have Thanks, Kaylin. Thanks for, for Bye. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm afraid to go after what happened. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm <laughs> not sure. <laughs> Sitting, Sitting silently <laughs> waiting to oh, see. Thank you. Emma Thank you. Well. Okay, sorry, I'm working on ending the stream. I think it's, uh, yes. They don't want it to 